Welcome to Painting with a Scientist. Today, we are going to be talking about the Cambrian. That's a period of Earth's history that was more than 500 million years ago. And to introduce you to the Cambrian, I wanted to show you a little fellow called Miller the Millipede. Now, this little millipede is very different from you and me because he does not have a skeleton. Miller has an outside skeleton called an exoskeleton. So all of his hard structures that give him support and help him to move through the world are on the outside of the body instead of on the inside. And exoskeletons are very different than the inside skeletons than we have. And these little guys, invertebrates, are a type of species, a type of animal that used to rule the world. And we're going to go back to the Cambrian and we're going to explore and learn more about the world's first top predator, Anomalocaris. Let me put Miller back into his little, his little enclosure real quick. Everyone say, goodbye, Miller. And then I will say hello to those who are in the chat and introduce our moderators who are here watching with us. I'll be right back. All right. A quick welcome to Nerding for Nature. Nerding for Nature is a good friend of mine who lives up in Canada and has an, a YouTube channel as well. So she's here in the chat today as a moderator. And hello to King Husky, Duck King, Space Queen, and Queen Donut, Queen Poppy, Deepa, Vivian, Two Bridges, McKenna, Addie, and a special welcome to you if you are watching the replay. I am happy to have you here joining me on a painting lesson. Now each time, and Helper Madison, thanks for being willing to be a moderator. Um, right now we just have um, Nerding for Nature as our moderator, but I really appreciate the support. And I appreciate everyone who contributes to the chat by saying kind things and good things, not starting little wars back and forth or silly things like that, and just being a good example. And I know that you do that and do a great job of it. Several of you guys do. Um, hello to Keiko, to Pamela, and to Nikki. So happy to have you here. And again, if you're watching the replay, welcome to you too. Today we are going to be painting Anomalocaris, one of my favorite prehistoric animals. And I have a little printout that I sketched, an outline that I'm going to be using. If you would like to use the same outline, I'm dropping the link um, in the, whoops, that is the wrong link. I'll, <laughs> I, I dropped the link into the, into the chat earlier and I will update the video description as well. But if you go to patreon.com slash science mom, it is the top post right now. I will drop that link into the chat real fast. And that's where you can download your own copy. I am using acrylics today, but you can use any type of paints or other coloring materials that you would like. You can use markers, you can use crayons, you can use watercolors, anything that you have on hand. Um, a couple great questions about millipedes. Are millipedes reptiles? No, they are not. Reptiles have a skeleton on the inside of their body. Millipedes are arthropods. They have a skeleton on the outside of their body. Their support structure is called an exoskeleton, and it's on the outside. Can they bite? Some millipedes can bite, but this millipede, the giant golden millipede, is quite friendly and docile, also very big, and as long as you're not hurting them, they are very gentle and they won't bite, but they do have some defense mechanisms. If they feel threatened, like if a bird is trying to eat them, they can actually ooze kind of a little bit of a poison outside of their skin. And it's not poisonous enough that it would hurt you or me if we were holding them, but if you were holding them maybe too tightly and they oozed that little defense mechanism that they have, if they oozed out some stinky stuff and you licked your hand, it would taste terrible. And if you were a bird, you would not eat one of those millipedes again. Nerding for Nature says that tempera paint is a good option. Definitely. So I'm using acrylic paints, but you can use any type of paints that you want. Oops, sorry for that. I bet that was loud. Can you use watercolor markers? Definitely. You definitely can. All right, let's get started. We are going to paint an underwater scene today because during the Cambrian, most life was in the oceans. There was not very much life on land yet at all. And the life that was in the ocean exploded with the number of different animals that we had and the type of animals during the beginning part of the Cambrian. We call it the Cambrian explosion. And Anomalocaris came on the scene then. So since we are painting underwater, I'm going to get some white 
and some blue ready because I want to have a light blue, a light blue green color for our background. That's the first thing that we're going to paint. And as always, when you're coloring and painting along with me, the nice thing about doing it with video is that if I'm going too fast, you can just pause. And then once you've caught up, then you can start it again. So I have a little bit of blue and a quite a bit of white here. And I'm also going to add just a little bit of green because I'm guessing, I haven't been to the Cambrian before, but my guess is that there was a lot of algae in these ocean waters and that we they would have had a nice aqua green color. So that's what I'm going for here. I'm going to mix together my paints and I've got a nice really light aqua green color that's coming but I think I want it just a little bit more, more green. So I'm gonna add a tiny bit more of green and a tiny bit more of blue, and then I will bring you close so that you have a good upfront view of our painting and we will get started. So here we go and angle down. Actually, move one of my little blocks of support and bring you right down here so that you can see really well. So here we have Animalocaris. We've got some sponges here, some jellyfish, and then a little invertebrate here and a trilobite and an echidnoderm, a relative of the starfish right there. And we're going to start out, like I mentioned, we're going to start out with painting our water. And I have a nice light blue here and I want this to, have you ever noticed that water kind of has like ripple? When you're looking kind of up towards the surface, you can see sort of these ripply patterns. So I'm going to paint sort of these ripples of the light blue. And then I'm going to come through again with a darker bluish green to try and give it an, a watery fill. That's my, that's my goal. But whenever I'm painting, I like to say, um, you know, kind of like Bob Ross did, happy accidents. We have beautiful mistakes, happy accidents. And if something doesn't turn out quite how we wanted, we don't worry about it. We just go with it. I feel like life is stressful en enough with other things where we have to get it right. That with painting, I just like to see what happens. It's all about exploring and enjoying, enjoying the journey. Like, for example, there, my... My darker blue is not looking very darker, but that is a-okay. I'll mix in just a little bit more of my blue. That's a little bit darker, but my ocean is a little more pastel than I intended. And that's okay. I'm not going to mind. I'm going to paint around this outline of my jellyfish. And get a little more water on my brush. And then paint over here. Another cool thing about the Cambrian is that the tides were stronger. Our moon is actually slowly moving further away from Earth. So during the Cambrian, the tides would have been stronger and you would have had larger movement in and out from the coastlines. And because of that larger movement in and out, you actually had a lot of really shallow oceans. So if you've ever been um, maybe to the Caribbean or an area maybe near Florida where the ocean is really shallow for a long ways and, you know, you can walk out and it's, you know, maybe the ocean is 10 to 12 feet deep and that continues for a long time. That type of shallow ocean was really common in the Cambrian because of those tides sweeping in and out. And so you had a lot of marine life that could access all of the light coming in to those shallow seas. And there were tons of animals living in the ocean at this time. Now I want our water to get a little bit darker as we do go deeper. So again, I've got my palette here. I'm gonna add on the edge just a little bit of blue and a little bit of green. And then I'm gonna start mixing it until it looks about right. So I grab just a bit of it first, start mixing in. Maybe all of it will be just fine. And I'm going to add a tiny bit more green up here. And first I'm going to paint this layer here, this new layer that I did, to try and kind of blend those edges. 
and then then we're going to add in more green to sort of see, you know show that our water is getting a little deeper and just a little bit darker because that's what happens anytime you're in the ocean or a lake the deeper down you go the more that the sunlight is absorbed by the water and the darker it gets and if your green is looking a little more you know your bluish green is greener than you anticipated you can always just kind of swipe it up to try and blend it in so that it doesn't look too different than the water that's up top. Grab a little bit more over here. And then once we once we finish our background, we'll paint the sea bottom and then we'll be ready to get in and start on our animals. I left a little bit of extra space in this drawing and I did that on purpose because once we paint one trilobite, I thought, you know what? I want you to be able to paint more trilobites if you want. I, if you want to cover the whole entire seafloor with trilobites, you can, because they were super numerous. There were a lot of trilobites at this time in Earth's history. And you can still find trilobites today. If you're out, um, it doesn't matter if you're on the tops of mountains or in valleys, there are so many areas all over the world where you find trilobite fossils. And that's because they were so common back here during the Cambrian. They were the most dominant animal on the planet, the most numerous one for millions of years before they went extinct. And same thing with the jellyfish. If you want to paint more jellyfish than just the two here, you can definitely add in more jellyfish because they were also pretty numerous. Although we don't know as much about the jellyfish as we do about the trilobites, just because they don't fossilize as well. You have to have really special circumstances in order to get a jellyfish, jellyfish fossil. The trilobite fossils, you can get fossils from them in lots of different ways. Jellyfish are a lot harder to fossilize just because they're so soft. There we go. Now our ocean waters are painted. And just touch up these white spots here. I like that quite a bit. I'm happy with the way that my blue is nice and blotchy and that it goes darker towards the bottom, giving it kind of an oceany type look. And now we're gonna paint the ocean bottom, the ocean floor. All right. And <laughs> I'm just checking out the chat. I, I don't have time to look at the chat quite as often when I'm doing this as I do during quarantine, but I will try to check in occasionally and answer questions. So Lynette asks, why don't jellyfish have bones? It's a great question. And I think the best answer is because they don't need to have bones. Jellyfish live in the ocean and they were some of the earliest animals to evolve. And they, you know, they started out kind of as really small, simple, sort of like, you can almost think of them as like extra big amoeba. And then as they got bigger and bigger, they didn't need to have bones because they're in water and the water supports them and they can just float through the ocean. And jellyfish are fascinating animals. There's a lot of variety between different jellyfish species and they live all over the world, but they do better in warmer waters. So you definitely find more of them in warm waters and the ocean back in the Cambrian was very warm. Now I've got some white and some green. I'm gonna add some brown to it for our ocean floor. Because our ocean floor is underwater and all of the light that's coming down through is coming through this water, that'll give it sort of a greenish look. And then I also wanted to add some green because I imagine that we had a good amount of cyanobacteria and other, other photosynthetic animals, tiny little microscopic animals living on the ocean floor at this time. We do have some evidence of some photosynthetic algae and other things that lived during the Cambrian. And I think it's definitely within the realm of possibility that the ocean floor would have been a colorful place with lots of small little animals. So here we go. I've got a nice kind of a grayish green, a little bit brownish. And just like we did on the top, I'm gonna sort of paint in little blotchy areas. And if you want to do more than one trilobite, 
you can leave some space open here so that you can add in more trilobites. In my Cambrian scene, this Anomalocaris was so hungry that it ate all the trilobites, except for this lone survivor right here. But in your ocean scene, you could have the ocean floor completely covered in trilobites. It is all up to you. And now that I've given some good blotches of green down here, I'm gonna add a little bit more brown. Ooh, fantastic question here. Kaylee asks if jellyfish are pink because of what they eat, just like flamingos. And in case you didn't know, flamingos are pink because of their diet of brine shrimp. And if you take a pink flamingo and move it to a different location where the food that it's eating is not this special type of brine shrimp that grows in this caustic soda lake, the flamingo will actually turn white. It won't be pink anymore. Its feathers will change color. And in terms of jellyfish, I am not sure. I think it would depend on the species. There are a lot of different colors of jellyfish. Some are pink, but then some, like the Portuguese man of war, are blue. And you have lots of different colors of jellyfish depending on the species. Some are orange, some have stripes, and some, down in the deep ocean, actually glow in the dark. And they have bioluminescence where little lines along them will glow different colors and send out flashes of light, just like glowworms or fireflies can glow in the dark, so can jellyfish, which is pretty cool. So that's a great question, Kaylee. I'm not sure of the answer. Another great question about jellyfish. Why do jellyfish have stingers from Adrian? Jellyfish have stingers um, to mostly to capture their prey. So it's usually either for them to eat or it's for self-defense. You have examples of both with different species of jellyfish, but for most of them, it's so that they can capture tiny little fish. And usually jellyfish are not eating large fish. They're eating like tiny little nymphs or little baby fish. And the stingers help them to do that. But there are also jellyfish who I imagine have stingers partly from, for self-defense to make sure that other things don't eat them. And what would be eating a jellyfish, you might ask? Well, there are actually quite a few ocean animals that eat jellyfish. Um, I believe the giant squid. Um, squid will eat jellyfish. Different types of squid will. And for other animals that would eat jellyfish, I would want to look it up and double check real quick. Because off the top of my head, I'm not entirely sure. But I do know that squid will sometimes eat jellyfish. I've just about finished my ocean floor now. And again, I made these little patches of green with the thought that there would be some photosynthetic algae growing down here. But not all photosynthetic animals are just green. Sometimes they have other pigments. And you know they might have chlorophyll in there to capture light, but they could have other pigments that hide that green color. Chlorophyll is always green, but that doesn't mean that leaves are always green. And I'm sure you've seen plants that have purple leaves or that have stripes on their leaves, different colors, and that can happen underwater too. So if you want to add different colors to your underwater ocean floor, maybe some purples and pinks just for fun, you definitely can. That is 100% allowed. Anytime that we're painting a prehistoric scene, we have a lot of artistic license with how we create it because there's a lot that we don't know. The fossils give us a picture of what life was like, but they don't give us the complete picture. And we have the fun job of filling in the details and making guesses about what it might have been like. Last little bit of floor over here. And now we're ready to start painting our animals. There we go. And Space Queen says, look at the chat, science mom. I'm looking through really, really quick. Hopefully the chat's not too active because hopefully most of you are painting or coloring. 
now that we have painted in our ocean floor and our water, it's time to paint our animals. And the first one that we're going to paint is a Malocaris, Anomalocaris. I mispronounced this, this fascinating animal's name. So Anomalocaris can be considered the world's first top predator because before Anomalocaris came on the scene, you had a lot of trilobites. And the trilobites were some of the biggest animals. And there were tons of different species of trilobites. Some of them were large, some of them were small, and there were trilobites that would eat other trilobites even. But there wasn't really a top predator yet, even though you did have some larger trilobites that might eat other trilobites. It wasn't until a Malacaris came on the scene that you really had a predator. And a Malacaris was the top predator. And we know from fossils that it did eat other trilobites. And I guess the reason why we say the trilobite wasn't the top predator is because we assume that there might have been some trilobites that were predatory and ate maybe little tiny baby trilobites of other species, but we don't know that for sure. We don't have good evidence in the fossil record, but with Anamalocaris, these little crazy mouthpieces that it had, these two tentacles that go out, they have these really interesting serrated edges on them, and we actually have trilobite fossils with chunks a bit out of them where you can see the exact tooth marks from Anomalocaris. Crazy, right? Now, what color was Anomalocaris? We really have no idea, but its name comes from unlike other squid because it does in some ways resemble a squid. It had an exoskeleton, just like our little millipede did that we saw at the beginning, and so it has these bony plates that would move to help it swim through the water. And I am going to choose some reds and purples for my Anomalocaris. If you look at shrimp and other invertebrates that live on the world today, you'll see an amazing variety of colors and shapes and sizes. So I think you can pick any colors you want for Anomalocaris because it's really, it's really just unknown. We have no idea what color this creature might have been. But because it was a top predator, there was nothing else that would eat Anomalocaris. I think it makes sense that it would have had some bright colors, maybe to attract a mate or to show off to other Anomalocaris. And it really did not need to sneak up on its prey because trilobites were everywhere. And this, this animal could swim a lot faster than the trilobites. So I don't think that it would need to camouflage itself. So that's why I'm gonna go with a nice, nice kind of bright purplish color. And then we're gonna do some reddish, reddish stripes along the side for our Anomalocaris. And it's even possible, you know, squid can change color. Maybe, maybe this Anomalocaris, maybe some of them were different colors than others. Maybe some of them were one color and others were different colors. Who knows? Now, how big was Anomalocaris? I bet you're wondering, how large was this thing? And the answer is pretty big. If I were swimming in a Cambrian ocean and Anomalocaris swam up close to me, I would want to get away. <laughs> because if I was laying down underwater, I'd be about from here to here. I'd be about as long as this paper and animal Anomalocaris would be almost as long as me if I were laying down underwater, which means that those mouth parts that it had could probably give me a pretty good bite. So if I were in the, pre -cam in the Cambrian Ocean and saw Anomalocaris, I would want to scramble out of the water real quick or be in one of those awesome shark cages, you know, where you can be underwater and see the see the predator up close but not not worry about getting bit that's what i would want to do and i'm going to add just a little bit more purple here because i want to transition to our tentacles being a little bit darker but i don't want to do it too fast because then they're going to look like they're striped i kind of want to blend it in a little bit so I'm going to get a little bit darker here, a little bit darker here. 
the eyes that Anamalocaris had actually were out on little stalks. And that's kind of hard to see from this paint, this outline that I drew, but you can look up other, other drawings of Anamalocaris. And the eyes were really interesting and they were kind of out on, on these stalks. So this animal could see really well, had excellent vision. Just gonna come along here with my with my brush and my my little teeth that are on the edge of these these crazy mouth parts that this animal had. They're kind of white still because I tried to paint around them, and I'm just gonna leave them like that because I think that looks pretty good. I'll get a little more of my light purple and try and kind of blend this in just a little bit better. And then for the eyes. I think it would be kind of funny to give our Animalocaris some cartoony eyes. In, in real life, we think that Animalocaris probably was, was a bit more like, um, had eyes that were similar to the trilobite, which are actually more similar to a fly's eyes than they are to our eyes. They were kind of a compound eye that had these really cool facets where you, know, you could see different directions at once but just because our painting is small and also because I think it would be kind of funny and cute, I'm going to actually just give a little eye here and a little eye here to our animal cars because that makes it look a little more cartoony-like and a little more friendly. In real life, I would be a little terrified to meet this guy, but looking at the fossils and um, just thinking about how it moved, this is definitely one of my most favorite prehistoric animals. And now for the fins, I think that our little fins that move through the water, it would be kind of fun to have some orange red going on. So I'm gonna paint a little stripe of red down each of these, and then I'm gonna come in with a light orange to kind of give our fins their color. But you can definitely do whatever you want with your animal cars. You can paint him, paint this animal like it's camouflaged, you can go all cartoon-like. You can use any colors you want. This is your prehistoric creation. Fun fact about Animalcaris, when they first discovered the fossils of this, they actually found them in pieces. So they found a fossilized mouth part of Animalcaris, and then they found the fossilized, like, and when I say mouth part, I mean like the main, kind of the main mouth underneath here. They found the little arms, and they actually misidentified Animalocaris as a plant at first. They thought it was a, a type of underwater plant. And then it wasn't until they found additional pieces that finally they put it together and realized, oh my goodness, this is the whole animal. Because it does not look like any other animal before or since. It has a very unique, very unique structure. I watered down my orange to be a little bit a little bit runnier than the other paints, the other acrylic paints I'm using, so that it would sort of blend in around my red spots in these fins. And these fins that come out on the side of the entire body, this is how Animalocaris moved. It would rotate these fins kind of up and down, sort of like, like a wave, and then they would propel it through the ocean. That's how it swam. And I will say, if you are an actual paleontologist and you're watching and I say something wrong, I hope you will correct me. Because when I do painting with a scientist, I like to take time to really do some research about the scenes that we're painting. And being that it's Monday and I had a lot of preparation to do for the whole week of quarantine, I did not have time to look up and research and fact check things about a Malacaris like I had hoped. So it is entirely possible that I will make a mistake and say something that's not true. And in that case, I hope you'll let me know in the comments if I do make a mistake. That's, that's really what I, one of my favorite things about doing painting with a scientist is that I get to be a researcher. I get to explore a topic, try and find out new things about it, and then share what I learned with you guys. 
I'm going to add just a little bit of orange to this red stripe as well to give it just a little more definition and help it kind of match the rest of the body. There we go. There's my Animalicaris. All right. Space Queen says that she made the Animalicaris say hooray for food. I like it. And please, yes, definitely don't start any arguments in the chat because if there is, if I look back over the chat later on and there is a lot of irrelevant discussion, um, then in the future for painting with a scientist, I'll just have to turn the chat off. And I don't want to do that because I do love to be able to take questions from you guys, but I'm not able to, to look at the chat as closely because I'm painting. So if it, if it does go way off topic, I'll just have to turn it off and I don't want to have to do that. Now we're going to paint our sponges. There were a lot of different varieties of sponges in the Cambrian, and some of them probably had bright colors. And then we're saying that because sponges today are incredibly varied, there's a lot of variety with sponges. Some of them are very bright. And they are not plants. They are stationary, like plants are. You know, they'll grow and live their whole life in one place. But they're more closely related to animals. And most sponges get their energy from eating food. And the food that they eat it can be called detritus. Detritus just means small little pieces of stuff. And in the ocean, you have tiny little bits of plankton and phytoplankton. You have um, tiny little baby fish and baby sponges, maybe tiny little baby trilobites. You have eggs from other animals that are floating through the water. And all of that tiny little stuff can be called detritus. And that's what most sponges eat. They're filter feeders. And so this opening up at the top, as water would pass through there, the sponges would sort of gather out their material. And just for fun, I'm going to make these sponges polka dotted. So I'll get a little blue paint, and we'll do some little blue spots on our sponges. You can paint your sponges any color that you would like. But remember, sponges are in our category of not plants. They might look like plants because they stay in the same location all their lives, but they are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And then this sponge here is a bigger sponge, and I'm going to make this one a different variety. This one's not going to be colored all bright. This one is going to be more of a brownish color. And I'm going to give this one some little some little kind of spiky little arms up here because some sponges had little bristles around their opening to kind of help them catch food. And I think this sponge would have been one of those. And then with a little bit of black mixed into my brown so that it's darker, I'm going to paint this side of our sponge so it's sort of dark. And then when I come and I do the other side with just the regular light brown, it'll give it more of a three-dimensional look. So our sponge will look a little more, a little more 3D, a little more realistic. Now I have my lighter brown over here. And I put that on pretty thick, but now I'm just going to sort of blend those two together to give a little bit of shading to my sponge. And now the only thing left is the inside. And I think it might be fun if our inside was sort of a dark reddish color. So I'm going to get a little bit of red, a little bit of black, mix those two together. And remember, anytime you're mixing red and black, a little bit of black, anytime you're mixing black, I should say, a little bit of black goes a long way. That looks almost completely black. I'm going to add a little more water to it. And then this is going to be the inside inside part of our sponge. Ooh, it almost turned out kind of purpley. And as it turns out, now you can't see the, the little arms that I painted to catch food at all. So if I want, after that dries, I can come back and paint them on later. Next, we're going to do our trilobite. Now our trilobite, we're not sure what color trilobites were, or at least if someone, if a researcher has figured out what trilobites are, what color they are, I don't know the answer to that. 
So I'm going to choose kind of a darkish blue because there's a predator who's after the trilobites. I think it makes sense that they would want to be somewhat camouflaged and a bright color would not make sense for them. So I'm gonna go with kind of a darkish blue because even though perfect camouflage would be better for this trilobite to escape Anomalocaris, I, I want to be able to see it in my painting. I don't want to have it completely blending in. So we're gonna go with mostly bluish and then a little stripe here, but that stripe's a little too bright. I don't want this guy to be dinner quite yet. So we'll kind of shade that in a bit. And then for his head, I'm gonna try my best to sort of paint around these eyes so that you can tell that he has eyes. I don't know if I'll succeed because those are really tiny, but I'll try. There we go. You can kind of tell that there are some eyes there. There's our little trilobite. Good luck, trilobite. Good luck escaping in a Malacaris. And I want to give him some antenna. And the easiest way to do that will be if I just get pure black paint. I'm gonna get a tiny little dot here. And then I'm gonna get it right on the edge of my brush. And if you have, if you have like a Sharpie marker, a Sharpie marker is an even easier way to draw in these antenna. And I'm just gonna whoop, little line there. Whoop, little line there for his antenna. There's my little trilobite. Now trilobites are the most common type of invertebrate that we had during the ocean, but they're not the only type. We also had a lot of other different types of little crustaceans and little, you know, early members of the arthropods. So spiders, scorpions, and crabs, all of those animals are arthropods. And these were like the first arthropods that we had around. There were lots of different types. And this little one up here, we're gonna paint kind of brownish. And looking at him, I just wanna say, run little arthropod, run! Or I should say swim, because the animal carus is right after him. But when I look at animal carus, because I like that animal too, I wanna say, oh, come on, go get him, go get him. And I have to say, I, I have that reaction anytime I watch nature documentaries. You know, you see the little baby seal and you're rooting for the little baby seal. You don't want that little baby seal to get eaten. But then you see the little baby polar bear cubs and the mom going out and hunting to feed those little baby polar bear cubs. And you're like, oh, come on, do it, do it, find some food. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty normal thing if we're feeling sympathy for our animals. You can have sympathy for both the prey and the predator, and that's just part of life. It's kind of a eat or get eaten world out in the out in the wild wild world. And let's see. Now we've got our jellyfish. Oh, and I will say, because I, I just saw a little comment here from Nerding for Nature saying that accidentally clicked on a comment to, to reply to it, and it clicked put in timeout. There have been accidents before, and it, the accident that I most especially want to hear about, because science mom Emily emailed me yesterday and said, I think I accidentally blocked one of our, one of our regular people who watches and comments. And if we accidentally block you and you find that you're not able to comment, you know, accidentally getting put in timeout, that's too bad, but it doesn't last for very long. A few, you know, a couple minutes go by and then you'll be back. But if we ever accidentally block you, please email us and let us know so we can unblock you because that, that has happened before. And science mom Emily told me yesterday that she thought it might have happened again, but wasn't sure. So let us know if that ever happens. Here's our jellyfish here. I'm going to paint kind of orangish stripes on this one, and then I'm going to go with pink. And here is a very light pink. I want to do it nice and light so it doesn't look red. And I'm going to add just a tiny bit of white to it. So here's right here, I'm making my pink and it looks just a little bit too reddish. So I'm going to add a little bit more white. And then here we go. 
little bit of pink in here for our jellyfish. And I'll tell you a story about the first, the first jellyfish that I saw. I actually thought it was a sea slug. I didn't realize it was a jellyfish. So we were, we were in Hawaii and we were on the beach kind of exploring around, looking around. And I saw this little blue shape on the, the sand and it was tiny. It was only about that big. And it was blue with kind of these white stripes and sort of oblong. And I thought, oh, it's a sea slug. Sea slugs are really cool animals. And my first thought was that I wanted to rescue this sea slug. I wanted to get it back into the ocean. But I also knew that some sea slugs had defense mechanisms. And, you know, I didn't want to get stung or, or injure the sea slug. So I didn't want to pick it up with my hands. So I scooped the sand underneath it and then very carefully carried it out in the water and then dropped it in the ocean. And then the next day I was looking in our little guidebook and realized that I had rescued and put back in the ocean a Portuguese man of war. It was not a slug, a sea slug. It was actually a Portuguese man of war. And if I had touched it accidentally with my hands, I could have gotten hurt really badly. And I felt a little bit embarrassed. So if you are going to be looking at the ocean and exploring the ocean, definitely make sure you look up any types of poisonous jellyfish that live there before you do because it's easy to mistake them for other things, especially when they wash up on land. They can look kind of weird because they kind of deflate. This jellyfish I'm painting blue because I'm imagining that it's kind of an incognito jellyfish. It's good at disguising itself. And then the last thing we have to paint here is our echidnoderm. So echidnoderms or echidnoderms are related to the starfish. And during the Precambrian, there were a ton of really interesting different types of echidnoderms. This one looks a bit like a sea anemone. And because I'm imagining that similar to sea anemones that we have today, this one might have had good defenses. I'm going to paint it some bright colors because I think that it would not need to worry about getting eaten. I think that it would be able to take care of itself and it would be a filter feeder, kind of like our sponges. So I'm gonna go with a nice light kind of pinkish color. And I don't know if this is bright enough paint to paint over where I accidentally covered those tentacles, but that's all right. We can, we can pretend like our sea anemone got messy and got some dirt on its tentacles when Anamalacaris swam by so fast chasing a trilobite. We'll paint these little tentacles in. And then for our trunk, I'm gonna want a slightly darker color, maybe a little more orangey red in there. So I'm just gonna kind of grab up some orange on my brush and paint that in. And after I painted that, I thought, you know what? That's way too orange. So I'm gonna get a little bit of brown and paint over that. There we go, I like that better. A little bit more brownish. And then the very last detail, and this is one thing that I like about painting, although if you are doing markers or crayons, you have the exact same ability. If you have a little white space that you missed, you just go to that little palette where you were painting before, grab a little bit of that paint, and then fill it in. So there we go, I'm filling in that, that ground around my tentacles on this echidnoderm. Something that I have often liked to just daydream about or imagine is what if this had become the dominant species or the dominant type of animal? Because we live in a world now where the vertebrates really are the dominant species, things with a backbone. So we've got lots of insects. We have, of course, lots of bacteria and all sorts of different animals. But if you look at the ones that are the biggest and the ones that are sort of making the biggest difference to the planet, I have to say it's, you know, the mammals and the reptiles, they're kind of the most noticeable things, mammals, reptiles, and birds. But what if instead it had been these guys? What if our starfish and echidnoderms, what if they had gone on and evolved to be, you know, like the big, the big type of animal that kind of takes over the planet? It's really crazy to imagine. You know, they have the, kind of this five-fold symmetry like what would things have looked like if they had been the ones that became dominant rather than our invertebrates and then fish and reptiles and mammals. All right, I'm gonna back up real quick 
And we have time for just a couple couple Q and A questions, real quick, and then and then we're done. I am going to post a picture of my drawing on Facebook and on Instagram. And if you would like to share your drawing with me, I hope that you'll share it online as well and tag me on Facebook or Instagram or share it in our album on Facebook. I would love to see what colors you used and how you brought this underwater scene to life. And I hope you enjoyed learning more about, about Anna Malacaris. Queen says, done at the same time as Science Mom. Space Mess says, wow, I'm really late. Don't worry, you can watch the replay. And Space King says, who are we chatting with on Friday? On Friday, on my quarantine show, we have an interview with a scientist, and our scientist is named Raven, and she has worked as a molecular biologist, and she's also worked developing new medicine and new drugs for drug companies to cure diseases. So we're going to talk about how a new medicine is made and some of the cool research she's done with molecular biology. Great question here. Are there any relatives to the Anomalocaris? Trying to find it and no worries about the spelling, Monica. It's a hard, hard one to say. There are not any living relatives to the Anomalocaris. It was really a strange animal and it was more than 500 million years ago that it lived. And the Cambrian explosion, there was a lot of life, but since then there have been several major extinction events. So we don't have anything alive today that resembles Anomalocaris. Good question. I would have to say the closing, closest living relative is probably something like a horseshoe crab. Um, a horseshoe crab has sort of that same, you know, structure, support structures on the outside type body that animal cars does, but of course they're very different animals. Um, Victoria asks, what is the big thing in the middle? That's the animal caris. That's the star of our show today. And then just three more questions. And I think Math Dad was giving me my time's up signal. Oh, great suggestion. Can we do something on about the science behind the Bermuda Triangle? I'll think about that. That might be a fun topic. Oh, and then Molly asks, have I ever seen a trilobite fossil? I have. In fact, um, last week, a friend of mine lent me a trilobite fossil, a really big one to, to show during one of our geology lessons. The cool thing about trilobites is when you find trilobite fossils, they might be this big. They might be this big. I got to stand back so you can see the size. Trilobites range in size from really large to really small, small and everything in between. There were so many different species of trilobites and they grew to very different sizes. And then last little question here, how do the tentacles of a jellyfish sting you? There are actually some really cool research on this because they, they work kind of like, they, they work kind of like, almost like a little gun. So there's, there's a little tentacle that has these little barbs on it and then when they come into contact with something, there's a part of the, the structure behind that little sting that actually shoots venom out really, really fast. And there's a, there's a video by um, a famous YouTuber called Smarter Every Day, Destin Sandlin. He actually did a really cool video talking about how jellyfish stings work, how, how they're able to do it so fast. And it was pretty impressive. Oh, and then this is a great question. Can jellyfish see? Jellyfish do not have eyes. They have a really different structure than we do. So I don't think that they can. I don't think jellyfish can see, but they do, they do tend to exhibit behaviors that seem to be intelligent where they will move toward things that they want to get closer to. They will move away from things they want to get further away from. And they, they seem to be able to sense light. They're able to tell when light is on and when light is off, but they're not doing that with eyes like eyes that you and I have. They're gathering that information from from different sensors, from different ways. So they do not have eyes. Great question. All right. And then very last question. What is my favorite animal? That is a hard question to answer, but I'll give you my, I'll give you three favorites right at the moment. So I have a pet desert tortoise. I love desert tortoises. I think they're really cool. Um, I think tardigrades, little tiny microscopic animals are some of the coolest animals ever. And I also love dogs. I think dogs are just absolutely wonderful. So thank you everyone for joining us and a big shout out and special thank you to Nerding for Nature for coming today and 
helping moderate the chat and be here with us. I super appreciate it. And Nerding for Nature has a, a great outdoor YouTube channel with some really cool videos about the outdoors and things that you can discover exploring in nature. So I will see you guys again on Friday with another Painting with a Scientist episode. And if you want to watch our math and science lessons, we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Thanks again for joining us. Bye.